Good morning, good afternoon, and Dow ladies. Thank you so much for joining us today for week two of Catholic Social Teaching. Um, week one was so amazing. I truly enjoyed it and enjoyed being a part of it. So I'm anxious to dive into uh, week two. But uh, before we do, just wanted to share a reflection um, that I've been thinking about this week, and it's something that the author of Catholic Social Teaching, um, Claire Furquist, said in one of our many launch events that we had before the study actually came out. And she said that both through our physical motherhood and spiritual motherhood, women have been champions of the human person from the start. And I think there's so much insight in that, in how really women are the ones that are the first champions of the human person that really bring as physical mothers, as wives, as sisters, and as spiritual mothers that really bring the ideas of Catholic social teaching and what it means to be human and what human beings need to flourish. We are the ones that really bring those those concepts to bear. And that's why I'm so excited to be a part of this group. And I'm so excited that you're joining us because um, as Pope Paul VI said in his closing address to the Second Vatican Council, he um, had an address to women he, and he, he said, women of the universe, it is up to you to save the peace of the world. And maybe he was even thinking about this time in our, in history, or he was a forecasting to this time in history when our country is so divided and it's very difficult to even have a conversation about these topics. So the fact that we're all together and learning together, I think is hugely important um, and hugely meaningful. So uh, with that as a real quick introduction, I wanna turn it over to Teresa Hodgins, our Endow host for the study, who is gonna lead us through chapter two of Catholic Social Teaching. Thank you, Annette. Um, welcome again to everybody. Uh, just a couple quick, just review points if you, or for anyone who wasn't here last week. Um, we won't be able to read through the whole chapter again, unfortunately. Hopefully your book arrived. Hopefully you ordered the book and it's there. Um, what we read today, I'll share on the screen, but we will be skipping section one today, which is kind of an amazingly compact and brief summary of um, history from the history of Catholic social teaching specifically, but from the time of Christ through um, Thomas Aquinas. So it covers a lot. It covers like a century and a half, basically. Um, so it's a lot of time and a lot like in a very short amount of um, reading, but it does a really nice job of kind of focusing in on how Christianity um, in becoming a, the dominant religion, starting from a, a minor sect to becoming the dominant religion, um, helped to influence society and culture throughout those that century and a half. Um, and then we'll dive into sections two and three. Again, just remember that if you have questions or technical difficulties or anything at all, to message Kelsey, our amazing technical person who is on as Endow. Um, and also if you have questions pertaining to the discussion, um, the panelists won't be able to look at the chat as much or at least consistently throughout um, uh, the webinar. Um, I was able to catch like bits and pieces of it last time. It was an awesome discussion, but if you have something specifically for a panelist, send it to Kelsey who will then send it on when we're able to look so that we make sure we get those questions um, and comments that you would like to share with the group as a whole. Um, we get those read out. Um, so Kelsey is on as in doubt. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, should be easy to find. Um, with that, um, we do just want to make sure we welcome Sister Mary Richards, who is joining us here today. Um, she's one of the little sisters of the poor, but I'm going to let her say a little bit about where she is and her involvement with her order, um, just so we kind of get to know her uh, as well. 
I'm originally from New Jersey, and um, I entered at the Little Sisters of the Home, of the Poor Home for the Elderly there after volunteering. And um, the first part of my religious life, I was with the residents in our homes for the elderly poor, and then for eight years in our publications office. But then for the last 26 years, I was the novice mistress in our novitiate in Queens Village. And just three months ago, I was transferred here to Louisville where I have the privilege of working with the elderly again and being at the service of my community. So thanks for inviting us. Thank you, sister. We're looking forward to hearing your perspective as being so involved with, um, with, a, with the elderly as the poor, right? And as um, living out Catholic social teaching so intimately in your life. Um, with that, I am going to, oh, no, nope, we're going to pray. I'm not going to dive in yet. Um, Jeanette is <laughs> going to lead us in the prayer for brief. Yes, so a reminder, it is part of Endow's mission to pray for our priest. So if you have your card, let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of our priests. Through them, we experience your presence in the sacraments. Help our priests to be strong in their vocation. Set their souls on fire with love for your people. Grant them the wisdom, understanding, and strength they need to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Inspire them with the vision of your kingdom. Give them the words they need to spread the gospel. Allow them to experience joy in their ministry. Help them to become instruments of your divine grace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns as a eternal priest. Amen. Amen. St. Clair, pray for us. Yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. So then I'm going to dive in to chapter two. So the section we are skipping is called the emergence of Christendom. And just a couple of notes. Um, the author highlights how we move from being a persecuted church to the dominant religion and how the, the um, how our social doctrine and how helping the poor and living in community really uh, influenced the early church, but then figuring out how to uh, minister to the poor as it grew was a a challenge for the early church um, as they developed um, some documents to know, some things where you're like, oh yeah, I've heard of that. I didn't think of it as Catholic social teaching um, that she highlights books that she highlights the St. Augustine City of God, which is a giant work and amazing, but also like it's heavy, um, but it is very much a social doctrine of this is what the city of God, this is what the Christian church should look like versus the world, the city of, of man. Um, and so it definitely is, I think, influential in developing Catholic social teaching um, in that foundation. Also, the rule of St. Benedict, um, as Benedict was trying to form his community, the monastic communities outside of um, outside of the world as the dominant culture was um, struggling with living its Christianity. And then finally, St. Francis and um, not anything he wrote, but his example and his calling out of church authorities and making sure that they kind of thought through how being Christian should look in the world. Um, and in, uh, in Christendom, right? This is the time of Christendom where we think everything, we sort of with rosy glass, rose colored glasses look back on Christendom and think, oh, it was amazing. It was so great. But the life in St. Francis tells us otherwise, right? As the St. Francis and St. Dominic and some of those other great reformers help us to see um, that each age has its own problems. Um, and then finally, she points to um, St. Thomas Aquinas and how his writing and understanding of the sacramental nature of the world, um, how the unity of body and soul really called Christians to um, think about caring for the bodies of 
uh, each person and the dignity of each person and really cemented the idea that the dignity of the person um, was central to the Christian message. And because of that dignity of each individual, what we needed to do as a church to care for each individual. Um, and so she does a really nice job of just grounding, um, grounding Catholic social teaching in the, who we think of as the church fathers, right? Not just this like modern development, but that it was present throughout even throughout the church's history, even though we don't call it Catholic social teaching or don't necessarily think of it as Catholic social teaching when we say Catholic social teaching. Um, so there's a brief, brief summary of the brief summary of church history. Um, <laughs> Go back and read the section, it's good. Uh, <laughs> again, um, but we are going to dive into sections two and three um, and hopefully you'll see why um, as we read through. So Annette, can you get us started? I will, I would be delighted. Um, I'm reading section two of chapter two called The Road to, to the Enlightenment on page 20 of the study guide. The term Christendom refers to the period in European history between the fourth and 16th centuries when Christianity was the main religion and its doctrines and practices were woven into the thinking, cultural understanding and governance of society. The culture was imbued with Judeo-Christian values. We see this in the beautiful churches built during this time and in the art, both of which pointed to an undoubtable awareness of the gospel in civil life. Virtue was encoded in law. Vice was punishable by law. Liturgy was part of everyday life. Faith in God informed every aspect of society. Remember that in speaking of Christendom, we're referring to the Western and Eastern worlds of Europe and Asia Minor. The church had spread to certain parts of Africa and India through the missionary journeys of the apostles, but for the most part, expansion of European Christian culture had not yet occurred. Much of present day North and South America, as well as most of Africa, Asia, and Australia were untouched by Christian missionaries and colonial power. This would shift in subsequent centuries expansion of trade and the Renaissance. Several waves wa washed over the Western and Eastern world in the 14th and 15th centuries that would decisively shift the balance from that of a Catholic Middle Ages to a more secular modern world with a totally new set of challenges. The first was a catastrophic pandemic called the bubonic plague or the Black Death, which wiped out one third of Europe's population between 1346 and 1550, 1353. This left Christendom weakened and in search of spiritual guidance. When the church seemed helpless to offer substantial aid, numerous priests dying themselves or abandoning their parishes when struck by the plague, many lost their faith. In the aftermath of this devastation, merchants took advantage of shortages by expanding their trade routes throughout the Mediterranean, making quick and substantial profits. This sparked a shift away from the local agrarian econo economies to markets and trade predicated on banks and the families that ran them. Some call this the birth of modern capitalism, a system in which capital or money moves freely according to supply and demand. One of the most successful of these families, the Medicis, used their wealth to patronize artists, scientists, architects, and writers in what is known as the Italian Renaissance. They also employed up to half of the city of Florence and held the largest bank in Europe. Their grip on the political and religious world of Italy for several centuries contributed to corruption in the church and led to some of the most mercenary popes in Catholic history. The Protestant Reformation. A major religious event in the 16th century catalyzed the further breakdown of the Western church. The Protestant Reformation. 
This challenge to church authority erupted to the surface in 1517 when Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses in Germany. A long list of grievances against the Catholic hierarchy, his complaints against corrupt practices sparked a popular outcry through Switzerland, Scandinavia, and the Netherlands, France, and England. Luther was an Augustinian monk who initially questioned certain churches leader, the church leaders, abuses of property and power, and ultimately he went on to reject papal authority altogether. Others, such as John Calvin and Holdrich Swingley in Switzerland, embraced this message of dissent and led their own charge against Rome. Though the reformers did not agree on doctrines such as the Eucharist and the saints, they all rejected papal authority. Putting scripture over tradition and the individual above the institutional church, thereby decentralizing authority. Vital to our discussion of Catholic social teaching are the shifts of mainstream Europe culture away from the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. The individual's right and freedom of choice would replace the church's understanding of the common good and human virtue as the dominant narrative. Think about what a total overhaul of the religious world did to European culture, along with the doctrines and practices that reformers rejected. Obligation toward the other as presupotent of human life was indirectly dismantled. Economics too played a role with an increased emphasis on trade and the acquisition and movement of capital throughout Europe. Wider markets emerged as a force that would draw people away from the local economies and the home into cities and centers of trade. Personal prosperity would replace a sense of shared community assets as had existed in the feudal system in the village life. The scientific revolution and the enlightenment. All right, sorry, really quick before I start. The, at the bottom, we have a little footnote that I wanna just highlight for a second, Teresa. The thing about the reformation, how language matters, like how we actually talk about things. So some people, refer to call it the revolution and not the reformation. We kept it reformation in the study because that's a more familiar term for people. Um, but that's a good little YouTube thing to think about how language affects how we see things. Okay, back to my job. The scientific revolution and the enlightenment. Renaissance humanism of the 15th and 16th centuries had many beautiful aspects that, that contributed to a deeper understanding of the human person. And seeped in faith, many of the works of this period were done for the glory of God, captured in the gorgeous frescoes of Raphael, the soaring basilicas of Michelangelo, and the inventions and paintings of Leonardo da Vinci. Alternately, thinkers such as Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton in the 16th and 17th centuries, who contributed to the scientific revolution, challenged accepted notions of astronomy, physics, and mathematics. Empiricism, a method devoted solely to that which can be proven through reason and experiment became the dominant form of knowledge. And theology receded into the realm of superstition and ignorance in the eyes of many. This separation of the disciplines represented a utilitarian worldview, useful in the work of advancing scientific discovery, but rejecting the transcendent mysteries of faith. The final blow to the old world was that was that was Christendom came in the 17th century with the Enlightenment, a name that suggests waking up from the quote unquote darkness of the Middle Ages and Christendom. With the separation of faith and reason and a rejection of church authority, individual experiment, rationality, and consent became primary. Political philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes and John Locke proposed contract theories of society that gave the state authority over the individual, 
through a mutual exchange of rights and duties. According to Hobbes, the state is sovereign and all other group persons such as corporations, associations, and churches only have authority by concession of the sovereign the state. In a sense, God is replaced by the state and in place of a community of persons, we are left with individuals fending for their rights. Before this time, when the state was deeply connected to the church, this authority was not so detrimental to human flourishing. But now that the state and the church are put in opposition, humanity's true nature rooted in creation and redeemed in the incarnation is no longer part of society's consideration. The advancements of the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution and the enlightenment all centered around the question of human freedom. If human beings are masters of their own reason and will, if their existence is contingent only on what they themselves understand, as summed up in Rene Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, what need do they have for spiritual authority? In the minds of the Enlightenment thinkers, authority outside of the individual and mutually agreed upon forms of government leads to corruption and tyranny. This was to be rejected in favor of individual freedom and the progress of scientific claims that could be proven empirically. America itself was a Protestant Enlightenment project that took on many of these new ideas in its inception as a democratic republic. The creation of the state, apart from both traditional monarchy and the church, was the major enterprise of the Enlightenment. And sadly, the radical individualism it promoted would lead to some of the bloodiest episodes in human history, the foremost being the French Revolution. The cry, liberté, fraternité, égalité, liberty, brotherhood, equality, could be one shouted from the streets of New York City in our own century. Yet the bloodshed and chaos of Paris in the 1790s reminds us that none of these ideals are possible without the sustaining work of God and the church. Let's pause and remember that there was much being promoted in all these stepping stones to modernity. Renaissance humanism, the Reformation, the scientific revolution, and the enlightenment that was perfectly coherent with Catholic doctrine. And there was much to be angry about in the corruption and misuse of church authority. But we are called to challenge the church from within out of love. Catholicism embraces a marriage of faith and reason that allows for development of human thinking, even questioning and scientific discovery. The church also condemns the kind of tyranny these movements decried looking to God as a loving creator who will save us from tyrants. Pope Benedict XVI succinctly said, we are creatures, therefore dependent on the creator. In the age of enlightenment, to atheism especially, this appeared as a dependence from which it was necessary to free oneself. In reality, however, it would be only a fatal dependence were this God creator a tyrant and not a good being. If instead this creator loves us and our dependence means being within the space of his love, in that case, it is precisely dependence that is freedom. This is precisely why we started this study with a contemplation of creation and the fall. Pride, wanting independence from God, is the perennial challenge of humanity. Can we truly proceed forward with God or without God? Looking back at Pope Benedict's quote, it is precisely dependence that is freedom. We see that this is indeed the scandal of the incarnation. True freedom is dependence on God. 
serviam, I will serve. This is as true for individuals as it is for communities and for our world as a whole. Through Catholic social thought, saints and theologians and popes remind us again and again that true freedom is found in God. The question is, what does it mean to be free? Are reason and scientific progress in a material sense really the way to true human freedom? A post-enlightenment world would say yes. And yet history shows us that without God, men become tyrants. Even good rational people who revolt against injustice become unmoored when they achieve what they thought they were seeking because ultimately we're only free in God. We can't build our own paradise, our own man-made version of heaven without sacrificing who we really are as human persons made in the image of God. Christ said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Reminding us that truth and freedom are utterly dependent on each other, united by a rigorous interplay of faith and reason. This is the freedom of the children of God found in Christ truth himself, a freedom that the world cannot give. Just a quick reminder, the panelists will discuss these questions. So I'll read them all and we'll discuss for a few minutes and then um, do the second section. And then we'll hopefully get some audience participation. We're excited to hear from you. Um, so a discussion question for this section. Number one, what is the connection between increased wealth and trade in 15th century Europe with the corrosion of church authority. Do you see this as true today? Number two, how did the Protestant Reformation further the cause of the secular state? How was humanism coherent with Catholicism? Where did it go wrong? And number three, in what ways are we as Americans in particular influenced by enlightenment thinking as we strive for a worldview that orders society according to God's law and the gospel, do you struggle with individualism? If so, how? Soft lady, the questions or things that struck you in the uh, in the section. Where to begin? <laughs> um, I think I'm always like amazed, uh, where is it? Yeah, I think I'm always, I like, I, you know, I can say the words, but to actually like believe them is another thing, just how much um, the church actually does want our freedom. You know, like actually, like it's not actually like the faith and reason, we, they actually need to like go together. Um, I think it's always hard Sometimes I think, again, this is kind of like the last question about struggling with individualism. Like, I think all of us struggle with individualism all the time. It's like, I want to do things my way on my timing, the way I think they should be done. And it's not always, I'm not like thinking about like church teaching every day, but just like dealing with your family, dealing with work, dealing with like, you look up on the wrong side of the bed. Like, I think the individuality is like, a, I feel like a constant um, invitation to like trust God more and to think about what true freedom really is. And that, um, that line by Pope Benedict about, uh, in that case, it is precisely dependence that is freedom. Um, everyone just froze. Am I still here? No. Yeah. Yes. Um, maybe you're all freezing with like, you know, you're like, she's crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone just froze. Okay. Anyways, but, um, dependence is freedom. And I think, um, you know, when Christ says to be childlike, when I watch my children, like when they're dependent, like they're free. Um, and I think that there's something, again, about actually owning that freedom is found in relationship and not in your latte in the corner. You know, like all the pictures of like the like your latte and your book in the corner, you're like, yes, that is, <laughs> that is happiness. Um, but it's not, like, it's not actually, we're not meant to be isolated you know, in the corner. Um, 
reading our book. Um, so yeah, I wanted to spring up that that dependence is freedom idea from Pope Benedict, I find very intriguing in thinking about all of this. Especially because I have a two year old who's very much in the I'm I do it phase. Like he wants to do everything. And sometimes he can't and it's good for him to try. But sometimes he just can't. And it's like a very like, okay, I have to let you find out that you can't do that yet and then ask for help. And then how many times, yeah, as you're talking, I'm like, how how many times does God do that to me? Like, let's let her find out she can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and then okay now now she's asking for help and i'll help her and it'll be better right. um, or asking for help from people around me kind of thing is also hard right because i think i can do it had you guys ever heard of the revolution term for the reformation no Teresa, no uh -huh. yeah that was yeah. news that was news to me we can thank simone rizkala for that uh for that hot tip. But um, Steve uh, Weidenkopf, Weidenkopf is the name of the historian who's writing here. And he uh, he's helped endow before with like, writing studies as well. But I think that's really worth like simmering on that the way that we call things really, it really matters. <laughs> like how we, like reformation again, is very like, yes, things are reformed, things are better. Whereas revolution is a very, again, I feel like that's a more accurate idea about what happened um during that time and like the upheaval um so yeah, I was curious I was like that was news to me and there's again that link um yeah Simone's writing history is written by the victors yeah I mean it's shocking again how we even the word enlightenment like oh things were rough and now we can think with reason it's like well I think they were thinking about reason before you know um so I just wanted to see if you guys had heard of that because I hadn't no, and I, I love what you said about, um, you know, true, the, the Pope Benedict quote, true freedom is dependence on God. Yeah. That's so countercultural. It's so against what we hold up in our culture to be freedom, um, to be dependent on someone, you know, in that way, seems like you're bound, like you're a slave, you're not free. But in reality, I think that people become slaves to their ideology. It's, it's almost um, ironic how when you take up the mantle of freedom without, let's say, the guidance of virtue, without the guidance of moral, morality, when you become free without that dependence, how quickly you will run your ship aground and find yourself enslaved to whatever ideology or um, concept you, you were fighting for in the first place. Right. And I think it's a, an invitation to have an active prayer life where we are reminded because we need to be reminded constantly who God is, who I am, creator, creature, how much I need him. And he reminds me how much I need the other, that it can't just be between me and him. We have to go out in community and how it does take humility to ask for help. And I think we touched on this last week, but we need to be const constantly humbled <laughs> and appreciate those moments of humiliation where we are reminded you are a creature you need me, you need to be reminded that I am God. And that in order for you to be free and truly love, you need to know you know, your identity as a daughter of God and know that we don't know everything and that we need each other to help each other out. Um, uh, and just a reminder to invite the Lord to everything I do. We need the constant reminder. Do you think that um, the pandemic had an effect on the way we think about being mutually 
dependent, you know. I was struck when you mentioned the bubonic plague and how Christian faith weakened and the priests weren't able to minister. And I said, that's been some people's experience during the pandemic. And people have said that in some areas, the faith has been weakened. But on the other hand, I think we've seen so many outstanding examples of virtue the first responders, people laying down their life for these total strangers, you know, you just hope that a lot of good will come out of that in spite of all the, the suffering. It's... Yeah, totally. I think the, um, I think the pandemic has like offered a lot of us again, that very tangible reality that we're not in charge. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, how many of us like made our 2020 plans? <laughs> you know, just kidding. Um, and even 2021 and 2022 and who knows, you know, um, but I think it's been a constant invitation, invitation to like, okay, I wasn't in charge before. It was all a fallacy that I thought I had any control over anything. And I think all of us now have this collective experience of like, what is it? Like, how do I respond today to be present to the other even though I don't know exactly, am I going to be looked at funny when I walk around outside, you know, like how, like how you're going to interact with um, other people. Um, and I think for women in particular, because of our, our nature to be open to the other and sensitive to the other, I feel like women in particular have been called to a different level of like um, cultivating community during this time, you know, and like loving our families who are all around us all the time. Um, which is kind of, an, again, an interesting part of living out um, kind of social teaching today that it feels, yeah, like you're saying, you're about the plague. And like, when we wrote this, it was pre-pandemic. <laughs> so we didn't realize, again, the iron, not the irony, but just like, oh, you know, that horrible plague back then. But now you're like, oh, this is actually a bit more, a bit more relevant than we initially realized when we wrote it. Right. Uh, and I feel like it's also shown us like being in the pandemic has shown us how much we do depend on each other, like how, how intimately united our society and our communities are, and whether or not we acknowledge that um, in thinking that we're independent, we do actually affect each other in right. many and diverse ways. And that that is an important part of being human. And that that's, it's not just an inconvenience that we infect each other with disease. It's, it's part of who we are and part of our society. And it needs to be um, both positive, po like positively to respond to the negative. Right. Um, the other uh, line in here that I wanted to bring up in our discussion was um, on 20, page 22, but we are called to challenge the church from within out of love. And um, that Catholicism embraces a marriage of faith and reason that allows for the development of human thinking and questioning and scientific discovery. I think again, like it, things are, paint, are painted so broadly, you know, in like high school text, textbooks or in sound bites about how the church like doesn't, you know, care about science and reason and it's just for superstitious old ladies and whatever. And I think it's again, uh, mentioned very briefly here, but I think it, it is worth noting um, that the church is like the questioning the church from within is actually like a very normal family thing. Like, wait, why did, why did that happen back then? How did, how do we make sense of this? How does this fit together? Like, it's actually a very, again, it's why we do what we do at Endow. Like it's, we're meant to like read these things and actually like talk about them and ask questions and not assume that everything makes sense and that everything, ha everything has a quick answer. Like it's worth, um, realizing that like science like is ultimately like about the study of god like ultimately science becomes theology because you want to know more about the world around you and then you wonder well who created all this um so yeah i just think it's really important um that we as catholics like feel very comfortable asking hard questions and even like for all the women watching like for your endowed groups to like allow diversity of opinions and again questioning from within a family is different than being like you know that crazy neighbor next door you know that that's different like actually with, around your dinner table talking with your parents and your siblings about things like that's a different environment than being like those crazy people over there you know so like doing the questioning and charity and not just in like the uh, you know not seeing uh, the church's other but like you are 
you are the church, you know, like you can actually ask questions about your history and your life. Um, so I love oh, that part. There's a difference between accusing and questioning. I think yes. it's the, like, it's just that the words matter again. The words like, matter. Yeah. And when, if you, and if you don't have a relationship with the people you are talking to, it often comes across as accusing. Right. Um, rather than questioning. So, right. Yeah. Um, right. I That's think, okay. and that you can do one last comment, and then we got to move on to section three. I was just going to say why. Um, I was just going to say that that's why social media is probably not the best place to do do the asking of these questions because the people that you you get interaction with are maybe not as connected to you as your family or your close circle of friends or your endowed group, so that um, things can be misunderstood and misinterpreted and can seem accusatory when when really all we want is to be able to have a dialogue to be able to come together and discuss and learn and grow together in our understanding that's all i wanted to say that's a good last thought i love it all right then i'm gonna let you kick off section three right. i'm very excited about this section okay section three is Les Miserables, uh, Les Miserables, the gospel collides with modernity. Many of us may be familiar with Victor Hugo's masterpiece, turned into the longest running musical in Broadway history, Les Miserables. It's a gorgeous, vivid tale of love, sacrifice, adventure, and redemption. Zoom out and Les Miserables is the story of post-enlightenment 19th century France following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. The country is in turmoil as the bourgeoisie clamor for just treatment of the workers and the impoverished to the deaf ears of the aristocracy. Zoom in, and it is the story of one individual's journey, journey from slavery to freedom, both physical and spiritual. This man is Jean Valjean, and his tale embodies the development of Catholic social teaching the gospel colliding with modernity. Jean Valjean was an ordinary man who stole a loaf of bread for his destitute sister and her child. For this crime, he was sentenced to 19 years of hard labor on a French prison ship. We don't know much about this time in his life, but we meet him at the end of his sentence, released on parole, which in those days, and even today, meant a kind of leper's exile. Again, at the point of desperation, one cold and lonely night, he is taken in by a kind bishop in a small town. Up until now, he has met with hostility and rejection, but Monsieur Bienvenu, a name which, which means welcome, offers him shelter, food, and friendship. Of this saintly priest, Hugo writes, it will be perceived that he had a particular, a peculiar manner of his own judging things. I suspect that he obtained it from the gospel. When Valjean encounters this man, he finds him unbelievable. He has never encountered such generosity and he does not know what to do with it. So he steals the bishop's silver in the dead of night and makes a run for it. He is apprehended by the police and brought back to the bishop, where astonishingly, Monsignor Bienvenu calmly assures them that he meant for Valjean to take his silver. Jean Valjean opened his eyes wide and stared at the venerable bishop with an expression which no human tongue can render any account of. My friend, resumed the bishop, before you go, here are your candlesticks, take them. The bishop drew near to him and said in a low voice, do not forget, never forget that you have promised to use this money in becoming an honest man. Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil, but to good. It is your soul that I buy from you. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. With this one act of mercy, the bishop stands between Jean Valjean and his accusers, and in his own words, buys his soul for God. 
by portraying the successor of the apostles in such a light, Hugo offers his reader hope in a traditional authority that many had dismissed in his day as rotten to the core, the church. Through the bishop, he recalls what a Christian is and should be, a conduit of grace, salt and leaven in the dough of the world, a release to prisoners, a lifter of burdens, bread for the hungry, a light to the nations. This was a deeply needed image in an age of corruption and opulence among the church among church leadership. Jean Valjean is dumbfounded and profoundly shaken by his encounter with Monsignor Bienvenu. He stumbles along the road, facing his sinful, dishonest behavior square in the face and turns his, li his life over to God. He not only becomes a man of prayer and virtue, he also rises to the rank of mayor in a small French village. Can you guys like hear the music in the background in your head about the musical? <laughs> so awesome. Okay. The light of Christ has saved Valjean, yet the darkness of his past continues to haunt him. Nearly the entire novel, he is on the run for having broken parole, sought by a cold-hearted man of the law, Inspector Javert. The bishop and Javert are juxtaposed in, Javon, in Valjean's life as dealers of divine mercy and worldly justice. The one sees Christ in every suffering person he encounters and offers them goodness and rest. The other relent, relentlessly seeks to punish the sinner according to the letter of the law, in the end, taking his own life when Valjean shows him mercy. The backdrop of this epic tale is a tumultuous Paris where idealistic university students are planning an uprising to yet again dispose the arist aristocratic government on behalf of the poor. Enlightenment thinking and revolutionary fer fervor collide with old wealth, cold-hearted power and military might, and the clash is quick, bloody, and fruitless. As Valjean slips among the student revolutionaries during their last stand at the barricade, he steals away with the wounded Marius, the love of his adopted daughter, Cosette's life, and saves him death. This act of relent of this act of selfless heroism is a sign of hope and salvation amidst the world's endlessly violent struggle towards a false freedom. Jean Valjean allows the gospel to transform him. His humility and gratitude in the face of his own redemption gives him eyes to see even Javert, his rightful enemy, as similarly worthy of mercy. He is a paradigm of restored humanity, making right the wrongs of others, seeking what is lost, extending his hand to the suffering and brokenhearted. Valjean dies in the light of a beatific vision. Hugo weeps for us a vivid and intricate tapestry of intersecting lives and social conditions in 19th century France. The divide between rich and poor is immense. The suffering of those characters caught in poverty and the system's ruthless traps is acute. Three responses emerge in the narrative that reveal to us the clash of modern secular values with those of the church. The first is the student's materialist solution born from enlightenment ideals, violent revolution, seeking liberation and equality that ultimately brings about nothing but further bloodshed. The second is the merciless judge and officer of the law, Javert, representing a legal system whose coldness and impersonalism cannot make exceptions and will not give or receive grace. And then there is the saintly bishop and the ex-convict who both receive and practice mercy. One sacrifices for the other, an act which multiplies and spreads throughout the narrative, promising salvation even amidst the darkness of suffering. It is the last response welcome, mercy, conversion, and sacrifice that reveals the way to true freedom and restoration of right relationship 
that is the gospel, and that is the heart of the church's social doctrine. Hugo is both calling for and reminding the church of her powerful message of hope in the face of modernity's crisis of culture. Discussion questions. Are there any characters in Les Miserables to whom you particularly relate? Do you find that you tend towards justice or mercy in your relationship? Two, in what way is Les Miserables a story of a post-enlightenment world and its values? And three, how are both the bishop and Jean Valjean icons of Christ and Catholic social teaching? Questions or anything that struck you from the section? Has every, sorry, are we all talking or is it just the panel right now? Right now, we'll do panel for about five minutes and then open it up to anyone who would like to comment or ask a question. So you can do that either by typing it in to endow um, and she'll send it on, or you can raise your hand. The raise your hand function is um, if you go down to the bottom and click on reaction, there's an option to raise your hand. And you, you, you can react. Or you can react, yeah. Or raise your hand and um, Kelsey will call on you when we are able to do that. But let's hear from the panel for first. Um, if no one has comments, I wanna call on Sister Mary Richard who gave us a hint early on of what, of something of, of her history, her order's history with Victor Hugo and Lehman. Okay, I was kind of excited to see this here because um, our mother foundress is St. John Chugan and um, she was actually born during the French Revolution and actually began her work of mercy um, in its wake in 1839. She, um, you know, I, when I think of her, I think of two main gestures. The first gesture was extending her hands to pick up an elderly, blind, paralyzed lady, carry her up all these stairs, put her in her own bed. And then that followed, you know, more old people would come. So then she found out she needed to go out to beg to be able to support them. So she ended up extending her hand again um, towards the rich and begging mm. for their mercy, you might say, you know. And um, really, you know, that's become our way of life all these years, more than 150 years this is going on around the world that, you um, you know, God extends his mercy to the elderly, maybe through our hands, but then um, the rich are given an opportunity to be merciful. And when I think of that was going on already um, before Victor Hugo wrote Les Miserables, that John Jugan had succeeded in creating this bond between the rich and the poor in right relationship in a way that the violence had not been able to accomplish, you know? And another last thing that struck me was that in 1845, after she had been at it only six years, the French Academy voted to give her the Montillon Award, which was given to a French peasant for a notable virtue. And at that meeting, she was not present, but Victor Hugo was. So oh apparently God. he had voted along with, um, Chateaubriand, Le Martin, um, in favor of her knowing her story, see? And I was, I always wonder the way it says here, um, how, you know, maybe Victor Hugo wanted to show people that the church could be a conduit of mercy, even though some people thought it was rotten to the core, you know? Um, did her story, her example, affect his way of thinking. It's just intriguing to me. Oh my gosh, I have the chills. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Oh my god. We love it. That's right. <laughs> wow. Sister, that it is so cool. It makes me think so there's a part in Les Mis where he and um Colette when she's young live with the sisters and he like works for yeah. he's the gardener. And that's like where they hide. It's their refuge from the world to like 
in between, you know, all of these episodes of Javert chasing them, it makes me think of like, is that what he was thinking of? You know, if these the sisters, um, I don't know, just, he clearly had a, a love for, for sisters um, in the way he portrays them in the, in the book. So, well, I and love I absolutely love what you said about um, the sister restoring the right relationship between the rich and the poor that all of the revolutionaries and the and the enlightened ones and um, you know the violent ones what they couldn't do she did just by reaching out her hand to both and you know we talked last week about how catholic social teaching is really about restoring right relationship you know between god and mankind and also between um, humans between us with one another. And what a beautiful example of how this can be done without violence, without power, because clearly she didn't have a lot of power in her society when she started. Now her order is, is, is quite amazing and very powerful in our world. But at the time she was, she was not someone that had a lot of um, social power. And, and yet at the same time, look what she was able to do. It's just and she, res and she responded to like the person on her doorstep. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It wasn't like, again, and the bishop too. It's not like the bishop was like wandering the streets for poor people. Like Jean Valjean comes to his do like doorstep. And like the fact that sister um, heard that before she said, like that she saw somebody in front of her, and, like took care of the person in front of her. Mm -hmm. so we don't like, I think I like to think about, you know, grand travels and figuring out changing the whole world. And I remember in eighth grade was very frustrated that I was like wait but I'm from California how am I gonna actually like I need to go to Calcutta I remember being a 14 year old being very upset being like I have to go to Calcutta to change the world and my teacher again was like formed by the Norbertines and he was like no like you don't have to go to <laughs> don't get on the next airplane 14 year old um but I think often we think about you know the big picture and again and this whole but you know this whole this, this whole massive amazing history that we have of our church responding to social situations like we every day are actually responding to the person on our doorstep and like that can and does actually change the world if we actually you know see it that way anyways um, i'm sure people are actually raising their hands so we have people waiting to speak before i call on somebody i want to this is actually a line from section one uh, but popped into my head and was like, I need to read this because it summarizes it perfectly. Basically, it's the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas um, and its distillation of Catholic social teaching is the person stands at the intersection then between the natural and the supernatural, the state and the church. And like that, that idea of the person, the individual, so John Bell John or the bishop is the one who brings that together, who brings mercy to the person in front of them like all of those ideas of it has to be through a person rather than through state or church or even but, like a program like a program yeah. it's like not about a program it's about a person and like yeah. it's much harder to be vulnerable to a person than it is to be like go to this program see you later <laughs> totally um okay so Bryn has been waiting very patiently I would love to hear from Bryn first, and I think if I ask you to unmute. Thank, Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I, I'm wondering if we do, do, uh, do a disservice by saying revolution, like using it interchangeably as good or evil, whereas revolution is to tear down a power. And people will say, you know, the Magnificat is revolution, you know, the mighty will be torn down, the lowly lifted up. But is that not restoration? I mean, what Jesus really came for, restoration and revolution is really just an exchange of power between men, whereas restoration is really giving the power back to God and, you know, letting him change us and not just the world. I mean, one at a time. So rest, restoration and just pondering that versus revolution, because a lot of people use revolution as it's a good thing. Do you see that? You know, they always talk about grassroots. But we're going to have a revolution. And right. I just think of a, you know, in, when Jesus shows Sister Faustina in the divine mercy, he shows her purgatory. And he says, my mercy doesn't want this. My justice demands it. 
And when Jesus would not condemn the adulterous woman, you know, how quickly we are to condemn our neighbors for sins they do, or for our people in power, the bishops, whoever, you know, for things they do. And we don't want to see restoration. We want to see revolution mm -hmm. as if, you know, so maybe that's just an American thing. I'm not sure. I was going to say, I feel like sometimes it's possible, like the American revolution, I think of as positive. Probably well, it, and because it's it brought actually, about government, but the French revolution, I think of as negative. And so you, yeah. I wonder if it's uh, like, if it depends on how it's being used kind of thing. But, um, but it was it wasn't a revolution. We didn't tear down King George from power. It was a war of independence. If we could call it by its real name, it would be a war of independence. Se Seton Home Study and their Catholic Home Study teaches that as well. If, real historians, that was not a revolution. We did not tell you how, everybody who was in power in the United States stayed in power. The rich stayed rich, the poor stayed poor. There was no revolution in the United States. We just kicked out the English rule and therefore it was a war of independence, mm -hmm. not a revolution, not a true revolution. But Bryn, I love what you said about uh, restoration uh, because that's kind of been a theme running through the the whole study so far is is restoring right relationship between um, God and mankind and mankind with one another. So I think that that's an excellent point and thank you for making it. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm gonna have to ponder it, definitely. Um, Miriam, I think you were the next to raise your hand and then Sheila. Um, yes, Byrne, thank you for uh, your comments, because I, I, I agree with you. Revolution can be a positive thing. I think a lot of the revolutions that we've been through, not only in, in America, but in Cuba and Venezuela and other places, it's because of oppression. That's the key. You know, that when, when you have wealth, there's abuse of wealth. And so it goes all back to the gospel. I mean, as I'm listening to all of these um, messages, I'm thinking of uh, Jesus's comments to the rich young man, you know, and also um, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, if we, we look at, you know, social Catholic teaching, it all goes back to the Sermon on the Mount and how we need to act that way in a merciful way, but to use our faith in action to look at these uh, oppressions that exist in our world today, especially in America with the poor, um, to look at some of the things that did come out of this French Revolution, because um, like Sister said so beautifully about her order, there was also uh, St. Vincent de Paul and Blessed Azanum, and, and um, who, who, who did the same thing, is, is, is reached out to the poor. And so the more we act like Jesus and imitate him, the more that this revolution becomes, um, like Byrne said, a, a reformation, you know, or, or a, a, a renewal. Yeah, the idea of a restoration to the original state of things, right? That we're restoring the way we're supposed to be in relationship with one another rather than um, tearing down uh, anyone. But the, I don't know, the revolution I'm still pondering this. Um, yeah, because so, wasn't Jesus also considered a revolutionary? Yeah, right. Very bad. Of love. <laughs> and, you know, when you think of the civil rights movement, that in a way was a revolution. And how did we come about that? We had a, a leader who, like uh, Mahatma Gandhi, did it in a peaceful way. So it can be done. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I think I think I'm still on the like it can be positive and it can be negative because there were a lot of bad things that happened during the French Revolution too, right? Oh and, yeah. Um, I mean, and it struggled for like years and years, um, and that that idea, the idea of um, the materialist uh, response, the students' response being the materialist quick response to. Um, to the problem, of, the problems of the day, um, and that that Hugo showing how that ultimately failed, but I mean, obviously failed because it didn't. Nothing was accomplished, and blood was shed. Right, people died, um, and so it was a tragedy um, in the novel. But seeing 
kind of how one person's response could bring about good. And again, it wasn't like quick and throughout the whole society kind of thing. Like, and so it's not as obvious of a revolution um, or response, but, um, but still, yeah, it is a revolution in the way that we are treating one another. Um, I don't know. I'm and it, um, it reminds me of the Bishop's response, how it was radical instead of him judging uh, with justice, he judged with mercy and looked at the human soul and his God-given mission to, to save souls. That moment where he receives the mercy of the bishop, I think there's an internal revolution in, in Jean where he can decide, do I look at my sin? Do I change or do I stay the same? And that, that mercy that was shown to him created that conversion. Yeah. And the candlesticks um, that he's given, I can't remember which, which movie version I'm thinking of, but one of them, the, they make a point, the cinematographer makes the point of like keeping the candlesticks all throughout the movie. So like when he's talking to his daughter later on, you still see the candlesticks in the background as like a sign of like this bishop's generosity to him is like always with him. And then also candlesticks, like he could have given him forks, you know, but like candlesticks are much more evocative of like the light of Christ and like what we're called to be. Um, I put in the chat, the Liam Neeson version of uh, Les Miserables is excellent, 1998. It's not a musical, but um, I think you'll still enjoy it. If you need some CST movie, movie uh, ideas. There you go. Um, I do want to get to Sheila because um, I'm waiting very patiently. Yes, she can unmute me. Yes, I'm patient. Um, it comes with age, ladies. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking of almost everything we said started with an aura, and so does the resurrection. So if we call it a, a revolution or a reform or a restoration, we're restoring our relationship with God. And what do we do when we do that? We rise with him, resurrection. And I'm getting chills saying this, but, and some people said renewal, but we have to use the word, unfortunately, revolution, because we have to advocate or go against or whatever we want to call it, but the bottom line is to restore our relationship with God so that we can rise with him. Mm -hmm. So our ultimate goal is resurrection. And I think I haven't seen the movie or read the book, but I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounded like he was on the path to rising with our Lord, uh, which is the bottom line of all your studies, I know. I mean... Right. Absolutely. right. So, yeah, the idea of rejecting, like rejecting. there's something to reject, right? Like, there's something to reject or, or there's something to, um, that's not right. Or, um, you know, there's just something to all of that. But the bottom line is to restore our relationship with God so that we can rise with him and, or with God, I should say. Um, that's all I have to say. You said it all. It's beautiful. You said it. That's perfect. You summed it all up. Um, I love it. We have one question that was written in, I think for sister, because I don't know the answer. Um, didn't John, you gone, John have her order taken away and then it was restored? Well, what happened was very early on, a young priest was supposed to be assisting them as a parish association. But little by little, he developed, he was becoming mentally unbalanced. So he deposed her and put in a young companion, 23 years old, and eventually even took her away from any contact with the public begging and sent her to our mother house just to live with the postulants and novices for the last 27 years of her life. And everybody was taught that he was the founder. She wasn't mentioned. And she just what? trusted that this work was God's, it wasn't hers. And she submitted in humility 
and she died in oblivion. But oh, this is your foundress. This is this our foundress. But the, the wonderful wow. thing was that 2,400 young women passed through that novitiate while she was there. She spoke little words to them. She gave them an example. And we feel like it was providential because she couldn't have touched all those lives if she was in one place outside of the mother house. But then finally, the truth came out at the turn of the, you know, the 20th century and took a long time, but she was finally canonized in 2009 by Pope Benedict. Wow, that's beautiful. Now we know why, now we know why Simone was like pushing for Little Sisters to be on this webinar. I mean, like incredible. She's incredible. And we're trying to imitate her, you know, humility isn't a popular thing in our culture. (laughs) So (laughs) anyway, but, um, that, that's what we think was really fruitful for the congregation was her humble submission. Yeah. Wow. yeah, well, and yeah, that she was able to form all of those sisters and so wasn't divided by, I mean, administration or like she was in the, in the order of strengthening the order. What a beautiful gift. I mean, that came from a terrible action. Like she could have done good otherwise, but yeah, what that God turned it to such... Yeah, it's such good yeah it, it's that whole like everything but i don't sorry somewhere in the scriptures like the blessed be like blessed be god like all the different good like whether it's good and, or bad like blessed be god you know and i think that's like so again like e- like uh, someone noted easier to be said than done but it is amazing mm-hmm. to actually realize no matter what happens in that day like god ordained it so like you don't have to actually stress out about trying to control it um and yeah sister is, how, how do you say her name jean sister well, i don't even say it properly <laughs> but it's jean <laughs> Chukang. Jean, jean, yeah. Okay. yeah okay i've always read it and with yeah, i've always read it too and i, I never won't even it. <laughs> yeah. i was like oh i do know who she's talking about but in my head like it's spelled jean jugan jugan yeah basically <laughs> but because i don't know french but she's french and so it sounds much more beautiful um, I think with that, ladies, we have to wrap up. We are coming, have come to the end of our time, but hopefully you all enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read our closing prayer in the Magnificat um, to end us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his humble servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel. For he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope to see you all next week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.